on the air tonight. Category 4 Hurricane Hillary is closing in with parts of Southern California under its first ever tropical storm warning. The new data we're just getting in from the Hurricane Hunter plane seconds ago telling us just how powerful this thing is. Warning of catastrophic and life-threatening flooding. And on Maui, word of more missteps in the wildfire response that could have contributed to the chaos and destruction in the town of Lahaina, what we're hearing from locals in just the last hour. We're also learning a lot tonight about where former President Trump will and will not be next week. The timing on his surrender to officials in Georgia and the debate he's planning to skip. We're live from the campaign trail. Plus, in the backstory, how two reporters uncovered hundreds of brains stored at the Smithsonian. The racist theory that led to the collection and the families just finding out their loved ones were a part of it. And in tonight's original girl dinner, maybe you're about to enjoy one tonight. So is it a harmless TikTok trend or a sign of diet culture gone disorder? That's later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and as we speak, a Category 4 hurricane is barreling its way towards Southern California, which is under the first tropical storm watch it's ever had. And in quite literally the last 90 seconds, not even, we're getting the very first data from the very first hurricane hunter planes flying through the eye of Storm Hillary, sending back some new data, data on just how intense this is. And here's the headline you should know about. The big warning, life-threatening and potentially catastrophic flooding. You are looking live right now at a briefing coming in, or about to start, rather, from the L.A. County Emergency Management folks, warning people, get ready. That is what they are expected to say. Stay ready. A lot of people want to know, where exactly is this storm going to go? Where's the track? You can see the latest prediction here aiming toward L.A., but here's the thing. It almost doesn't matter what the track is specifically, because... What we do know is this, wherever it makes landfall, it's going to drop a ton of rain over SoCal. Places like Death Valley and Palm Springs could see up to three years worth of rain in the span of just three days. That's why there is such a big concern now about flooding, with officials handing out sandbags in several towns today so folks can get prepped. Joshua Tree National Park is shutting down some spots that are more likely to flood. And several airlines are getting rid of change fees for people planning to travel to Cabo San Lucas over the next few days. That is in the path of the storm as well. We've got meteorologists Bill Karens and Liz Kreutz in Los Angeles. But, Bill, let me start with you. This new update from the National Hurricane Center coming in truly as we are coming on the air. Give us the uh, update. Yeah, the two big points that we want to bring from the National Hurricane Center update that just came in minutes ago. One, the landfall and the movement into Southern California is a little faster now. We're really thinking Sunday night. So instead of you know, worrying about the Monday morning commute, it's really Sunday evening when the worst of the weather is going to be around San Diego towards Los Angeles. So that's kind of the first point. The second point is that it's slightly weaker than what was estimated. So before we had the hurricane fly in, they were looking at the satellite presentation, which you see here, and they were estimating based on past storms how strong they thought it was. Well, the hurricane hunters flew into it, and they gave us the exact measurements. And instead of 145 mile per hour winds, we're at 130. So that's, we won't want this storm to be as weak as possible. So we'll take that trend. And it's now going to start accelerating to the north. Nothing has changed with the path. It hasn't changed in the last 24 to 48 hours. It's still going to go up along the Baja and up into Southern California. It's going to slowly weaken across that entire time. How strong exactly will it be when it gets to Southern California? We'll find out that Sunday. It does not look to be about a hurricane. It's about a 1% chance it would still be a hurricane by the time it got to San Diego. So likely a tropical storm. And you can see they still think that when it's all roughly parallel in between Palm Springs and Los Angeles, that's Sunday at 11 p.m. So that would put the worst in San Diego right around sunset, sometime right around maybe around 6 to 7 o'clock in the evening. That's when the strongest winds and heaviest rain could be in Southern California. So that's one of the points that we'll watch. Our computer models, excellent agreement. Again, there's really no disagreement with where the storm is heading. Arizona, you're off the hook with this one. And as far as the watches go, yes, this is the first time that Southern California has ever been in the history of the Hurricane Center in a tropical storm watch. These will likely be converted to warnings early tomorrow morning, all the way up towards Malibu and southwards. And then the flash flooding, that's the storm. At 95% yeah. of the damage from the storm is going to come from all this water. Well, that's the big concern, Bill. I'm going to have you stand by. But Liz Kreutz, you are live for us there in Southern California. People there aren't used to this kind of thing, right? This is super rare for the area where you are. Um, the big electric company there kind of laid this out. Crews, they get how to handle a lot of heat. They've been juggling that. Now they have to get ready for the storm that's coming in. Fill us in on what you're seeing on the ground and where things go in the next 24 hours. 
Yeah, Holly, I know you know this area well as well. I grew up here. This is really unprecedented. As you guys mentioned, it's been 84 years since a tropical storm has hit Southern California. So I think a lot of folks here don't even really know what to expect. Flash flooding, of course, is the really big concern. So communities all across Southern California right now are preparing from the coastal areas to the inland areas like Palm Springs to even up in the mountains. These areas are handing out sandbags to folks to try to prevent flooding. Some of those beach communities are also building sand barriers on the beach to try to prevent flooding in the low-lying regions on the coast. San Diego, they've even said that they might try to release water from one of their reservoirs in anticipation of potential spillage from all of this rain. But that said, it's not just the rain and the flooding that's a concern. There's other issues at play as well. Here's what an official here in California is warning. This storm can bring wind, rain, and flooding but also there will be lightning. With lightning can come fires. So we're being prepared for all and any type of emergencies or disasters that may be in this area. And back in 2020, actually, that was a big issue in Northern California. A summer storm had lightning. It led to really big fires. So that is the reality here in Southern California. The next 24 to 48 hours are going to be critical, and communities are definitely starting to prepare. Although, of course, right now it's warm and sunny here in L.A., so people are just getting word that they need to get ready. Well, that's right. The next 48 hours, so, so important. Liz, thank you. Bill, let me bring you back in because it's not just extreme weather in Southern California. You've got millions of people under heat alerts, wildfires, more than 100 of them in Louisiana. Something else that's not super expected for them this time of year. Uh, and, and the heat just won't break. I mean, I hate to say it, but it, next week is going to be the hottest week of the year in a few spots. And we're talking about the Midwest, our friends from St. Louis to Minneapolis, and heading into areas like Memphis. That's going to be exceptionally hot. So this heat dome that has been in much of the south is now expanding next week. So Saturday, it could be near record highs from Dallas to Oklahoma City. And then by the time we get to Sunday, same places, all of Texas just roasting. Louisiana, too. No rain in sight under this to help with any of those fires that have flared up. And even into Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, St. Louis, near 100 each and every day. Chicago, not bad. Kind of Chicago south is where the worst it will be. And Atlanta's going to cook, too. You should be up near 100 Tuesday and Wednesday. So, yeah, pretty extreme weather. We, obviously, what's going on in Southern California just makes everyone shake their head. Yeah. You know, this heat, though, just won't end, won't end either. Bill, thank you, Liz. Thank you as well. We'll be checking back in, I know, in the hours to come. Appreciate it. Let's take you to Maui now, where federal investigators are heading as we speak to get a better handle on how those devastating wildfires got so bad so fast, with new signs of potential missteps in the emergency response. In just the last hour, we heard directly from folks who live or lived past tense in the historic town of Lahaina that was all but incinerated by this fire. They say they want to be included in the rebuilding. Listen. Put the community first in any planning process for rebuilding Lahaina. The governor should work with the community to develop a plan that, need, that meets the needs of the people. We're also finding out that Maui's top emergency management official has stepped down just a day after defending his decision not to sound the warning sirens, something some locals have pointed out could have saved lives even if just one of the now at least 111 people who have been killed. I want to get to Dana Griffin now, who is live for us on the island of Maui. Talk us through what we're seeing tonight and some of the questions around these potential missteps. Yeah, Hallie, we actually just had a woman that walked up to us. She's a kindergarten teacher. She was furious, for, furious at Indaya, saying that he should have owned it. She says... People aren't dumb. They would not have ran toward the flames. They would have gone toward safety. She says he should have owned it, and she was really upset with his words. Uh, here in Lahaina, as investigators are still combing through the wreckage, trying to find the missing, one of the concerns is making sure that when that recovery process starts, that locals are included. There have been talks of possibly turning parts into a memorial. And the big concern, as we've been talking about for the last week and a half, is making sure that that property stays in the hand of the people and that this is not a part of a land grab. Listen to more of what was said at that press conference moments ago. Give us time to heal. Give us time to close, to find closure and be open and allow us to sit at that table so we can be a part of the solution and not the problem.
And that closure is not going to come anytime soon as, again, there are still crews behind us still making sure they are checking every spot for the remains. And then they're also trying to make sure the, the, the area is safe. There have been concerns about health and air quality. So that's also going to be part of this long, long process, Hallie. We have the federal investigators now on the way to Maui. We also have this independent investigation that you and I talked about as it broke about 24 hours ago here on this show. So there is this review on multiple fronts happening into the origins of this fire and the accountability factor. What's the timeline until we start to get yeah. some real answers here? It could take weeks, months, possibly years, Hallie. We have no idea. We know that federal investigators are on the ground now. They will try to determine the cause of this fire. We've heard from residents who say they saw how the fire started. They say it was a down power line that sparked and we saw smoke and we saw flames. Hawaiian Electric has not commented on the litigation that it is now facing. And we just learned moments ago a fifth lawsuit has now been filed. And so hmm. there's a lot of accountability here. There's so yeah. much going on as far as the in, the investigation for that, that independent third party that the attorney general has commissioned. We've also got ATF on the ground trying to figure out what caused this. And I think it's going to help bring some closure to this community. They want to know what happened, what went wrong, who made the decisions, and possibly, Hallie, we could see more uh, officials call to the table and possibly more resignations. Dana Griffin, live for us there at near the town of Lahaina on Maui. Dana, thank you. We are just learning late tonight that former President Donald Trump is expected to surrender to police in Georgia no earlier than Thursday of next week, according to multiple sources familiar with the planning. So that answers one big question coming up on Mr. Trump's legal timeline. But there is another question on his political timeline. Is he going to show up for the first Republican primary debate on Wednesday? Doesn't look like it. Sources familiar with his thinking tell our team he's trying instead to arrange a sit down with Tucker Carlson to air on the same night. That could get tricky, since a source close to Carlson says he's in Europe with no set-in-stone plans to interview the former president at this point. Even if Mr. Trump is not on that stage, he's still going to be a target for his Republican rivals, as former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie is making clear in his reaction to the news. Trump won't go to the debate. Will not go to the debate? No. His loss. Shaq Brewster is joining us now from Miami, traveling with the former governor. So listen, we, we now have, we've been talking a lot about the political timeline here for the GOP primary. Next, first debate is six days from now, not even, it's on Wednesday. It is possible that the day after that, Shaq, we could see Donald Trump as early as Thursday then, based on our reporting, go in and surrender in his fourth indictment now, the fourth time he is facing charges since he left the White House. Walk us through how this might affect the strategy for his rivals and the significance of this moment. Yeah, look, you know, the thing about presidential debates, especially this early in the cycle, is that this is the biggest audience that these candidates will get uh, to have and be able to, to introduce themselves, to get their message out to people. And it seems as if Donald Trump is doing what he can to get in the way of that, to at least make the effect of the debate, all the conversation afterwards, to at least block that and for lack of a better word, Trump that. Uh, you know, one thing that we noticed is that with Chris Christie, he has been talking about the debate since the beginning of his campaign. He's been teasing this moment. You saw him there uh, when a reporter mentioned that Trump will not be there. You saw him say, well, his loss. Well, I'll tell you, when you heard him talking to voters, it was very clear he wants Donald Trump on that stage. And I asked him about that a little bit as he was here in Miami campaigning. Do you prefer that Donald Trump's on that debate stage on Wednesday? I prefer that everybody who wants to be president of the United States and win the Republican nomination be on the stage. Because I think Republican voters deserve the respect to show up and to argue the issues with the other candidates who have qualified. We know, and the reality is, despite Donald Trump not being there, he will likely still dominate a lot of attention on that stage. He's dominating headlines. He's far ahead in the polls. You have candidates ready to attack him. So there will be some adjustment of strategy, but there will still be a lot of attention on the former president, Hallie. Um, he, he won't be on that debate stage, right? He is the far and away front runner. And I should say, based on what we know now, he won't be on that debate stage unless something bananas happens in the next seven days or so. There are other people who may not right there are other people who may not be on that debate stage not because they don't want to be there but because they're not going to qualify for it. I'm thinking of for example yeah. um, 
Francis Suarez, right, who went ahead and said, oh, I think, uh, you know, I've, I'm going to make the stage. He's, of course, well known to folks there in Miami for obvious reasons. Not so clear from the RNC that that's actually the case. Sources there say to NBC, well, he hasn't met the criteria. I say all this to say there are some people who are considered more long shot candidates who would love to have that national exposure that you're talking about who may not get it who would love to have it, who may not get it, but who definitely need it. I mean, look at the candidates that you're talking about. You're not just talking about Francis Suarez, who's the Miami mayor. You're talking about candidates like Will Hurd, Asa Hutchinson. You look at that graphic that I believe we have, uh, you see most of them haven't even qualified for most of the polls that are up there. They haven't registered at this point. So they need this attention, and it seems like they're not going to get it if they don't qualify for that debate stage. We do know that in conversations that that our in-bets have had with some of these uh, with some of these candidates. They've said that they'll rethink what they want to do if they stay in this race, if they don't make that debate stage. Shaq Brewster, live for us in Miami. Shaq, thank you. A diplomatic show of force tonight from Camp David with President Biden flanked by the leaders of Japan and South Korea for their first ever three-way summit, announcing the launch of Hotline to talk about how to respond to threats in the face of tensions with China and stepped up North Korean missile tests. That's even as President Biden is downplaying how much China is factoring into this meeting, saying instead this is all about finding ways for world leaders to stand together. I can think of no more fitting location to begin the next era, our next era of cooperation, a place that has long symbolized the power of new beginnings and new possibilities. We've all committed to swiftly consult with each other in response to threats to any one of our countries from whatever source it occurs. Senior News Chief White House Correspondent Kristen Welker is joining us now. So, Kristen, to, to the president's point, he says, hey, this meeting is not just about China, right? This summit is not just about China. It is still a little bit about China, right? I mean, that is an undeniable factor in this discussion here, despite the many other geopolitical issues that they're going to be talking about. It's undoubtedly about a rising China, Hallie. There's no doubt about that. Look, there are deep concerns within the United States, South Korea, and Japan about China's increased aggressions, whether it be cyber threats or currency manipulation. And so that was one of the central focuses of this trilateral summit, Hallie. But it, this was a broad summit. Look, North Korea was front and center as well, with growing concerns that Russia could be helping North Korea expand its nuclear arsenal. There were deliverables that came out of this three-way meeting. Let me just read you a couple of the key points. A new intelligence sharing agreement, Hallie, regular joint military exercises. It also sets up what you referred to, what they're calling that three-way crisis hotline. That is notable because it effectively allows these three leaders to be able to communicate if there were a crisis, if there were a threat for example, from North Korea. And you kept hearing that word security over and over again, spoken by President Biden and the other two leaders, really underscoring that this is about mutual security. Now, in terms of the reaction, China had a lot to say. China's foreign minister accusing the White House of trying to effectively start a mini NATO in Asia, something that White House officials say is not the case, but it underscores how serious and significant this summit is, Hallie. It's also interesting, as we look at some of that video, you know, Camp David, it's a special place, right? Like, it is kind of the local vacation home for, for the president and his family, for any president, but it's also the site of just incredibly important diplomatic work. And there is a significance to the setting here, Kristen. For people who don't know, Camp David is not too far out of Washington, but it's sort of tucked away in the woods. It's this retreat, if you will, and the president's putting it to use. Absolutely. And he has talked about the significance of using Camp David as a backdrop. White House officials have talked about the significance. Camp David is, of course, the place where former President Bill Clinton held those peace talks with the Palestinian and Israeli delegations. They're the play, it's the place where those critical talks after World War II took place. And so it holds a very serious 
significance in the history of this country. And this is the first time that President Biden has hosted foreign leaders at Camp David Halley. So it really shows you the extent to which the White House is putting an importance on these trilateral talks that are unfolding. Now, the question becomes, what happens next? Of course, this signifies the fact that South Korea and Japan put aside decades of tensions between these two countries. President Biden spoke to that. I want to recognize the important work that both of you have done and the political courage, and I mean this sincerely, the political courage that you both demonstrated to resolve difficult issues that have stood in the way for a long time of a close relationship between Japan and Korea and with the United States. And of course, big, big picture, Hallie, we are entering, we are in a re-election cycle, I should say, and of course, former President Trump who is the current GOP frontrunner, has a very different perspective when it comes to these geopolitical relationships. So concerns on the world stage that will the agreements made at this summit, will they hold if there's someone new in the White House? Hallie. Kristen Welker, uh, smart reporting, smart analysis as always. It's good to see you, friend, on the White Thank House you. North Lawn. Thank you. Right now, inside an Idaho courtroom, a judge is deciding whether to delay the trial of Brian Koberger, the man accused of killing four University of Idaho students last fall. It's a case that's captured headlines all around the world. You can see the suspect inside court today. So the judge is hearing a bunch of arguments from both sides about a bunch of things, specifically allegations of juror bias, questions about his alibi, etc. Koberger faces four first-degree murder charges in the stabbing deaths of Kaylee Gonsalves, Zana Kernodal, Madison Mogan, and Ethan Chapin. With less than two months until the scheduled trial start date, this hearing is going to be critical in determining timeline here. Will this trial happen as expected or not? Aaron McLaughlin is joining us now. So what do we think, Aaron? based on what we're seeing in court today, does this timeline remain on track? Well, Hallie, experts are skeptical about that October 2nd trial date going forward, given that this is a death penalty case during today's proceedings, which are still underway. The judge himself pointing to that six-week timetable, and yet Brian Koberger has yet to waive his right to a speedy trial. Instead, the defense has been applying for these stays, having been granted a 37-day stay that somehow doesn't impact that date for the trial. And the prosecution is alleging that the defense is essentially trying to have it both ways, which is why they filed a motion under consideration of the court to have the judge clearly outline a schedule for these proceedings. Earlier, I spoke to a former Idaho prosecutor who explained why it's so important to have clarity. Take a listen. They are three months out. Um, this is a significant case with a lot of evidence, a lot of technical evidence, a lot of witnesses that have to be flown in. Um, and that's going to, you know, that takes a lot of, of, um, time and preparation and, quite frankly, money. Um, if they are buying plane tickets and this is and that, and then the case gets canceled and they have to redo everything. So far, the bulk of today's hearing, though, has been focused on DNA evidence, the defense trying to compel the prosecution to hand over more discovery, calling a number of witnesses. They're still going through that. They have a whole other list of things to address as well. Just another illustration of just how slow this process is, bringing more doubt about that October 2nd court date. Hallie. Aaron McLaughlin, thank you very much for that reporting and that update. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, a new report sharing some of the surprisingly aggressive ways some hospitals are trying to get their bills paid by patients. What's being done to protect some of those people down the road? Plus, bus meltdowns meant today was back to school round two for some kids in Kentucky. Why we're seeing this problem play out across the country and what some parents are doing about it to track their kids on the bus. Coming up. Kids in Louisville are back in class today with some parents holding their breath to see if school bus drop off is actually going to work out tonight. That's after school was canceled for a week, meaning the second day of school came days after the first day of school. Because on day one, some kids ended up stranded, stuck on school buses until as late as 10 o'clock at night. That's why today some parents went to great lengths to keep track of their kids. 
I did go out and get some air tags just so I could keep track of their backpacks. Um, so I told my girls, I know where you are at all times. Um, so I've kind of got eyes on them. The old air tag in the backpack. The school district is now staggering reopening. So the littler kids, elementary, middle school, they go back today. High schoolers go back Monday after the superintendent took the heat for all the issues at a pretty spicy school board meeting this week. I was about not anticipating these problems, and these should have been anticipated, and they should have been taken care of over the summer months. There is no doubt about that. I take responsibility for not asking the tough questions and not being as involved in the oversight as I should have been. Maggie Vespa is joining us now. She's been all over this story live for us from Louisville. I think it's fair to say this was not just a meltdown. It was an epic meltdown. It legit took a full week to try to straighten out. So here we are, 527 yeah. Eastern time. Are the kids home? Did it go smoothly? Are some parents still waiting? Hallie, not only are a lot of kids not home, but I want to point out, and this blew our team away, the plan right now for the rest of the school year is that a lot of kids wouldn't be home by this point. That's how bad this shortage is, that if everything with the bus route goes according to plan, a lot of little kids, like elementary school kids, wouldn't get home from school until like 5.30 in the evening. One dad told us, he said, to get his kids five miles from school to home, takes an hour and that is because they have so few drivers and so many kids that every route has a ton of stops on it so think just like how they would have to kind of snake through different neighborhoods making multiple stops along the way and listen the district said look we have 600 drivers now we had about 900 like less than a decade ago the shortage is staggering and what they've tried to do is kind of condense those routes like I talked about but they said the big thing that they didn't predict was that they also take kids to depots to switch buses as part of this new system that took way longer than they thought it was going to. And frankly, they said each stop, because this is a new system, also took way longer. So just as you said, epic meltdown all around. Parents, understandably furious. Take a listen. The I just hope they get it together. And this is not going to be paid for by our jobs. We're not going to be late and then the jobs be like, oh, we got you, we understand. No, it's not going to happen that way. So they need to understand that you're inconveniencing us all around. That mom that we talked to, by the way, Hallie, she drove her daughter to school after the bus was late again this morning. She said, I have, I've had it, I have to take you to school, and then I have to go to work, as you heard. So parents still adjusting amid all of this. This bus driver shortage is not just a problem where you are, Maggie. It is a problem for school districts across the country, not having enough drivers to get kids where they need to go. Yeah, a company called Hop, Skip, Drive that apparently studies this sort of thing said their new study out, out this year uh, at actually 92 percent of school leaders nationwide, 92 percent report that they have a shortage of bus drivers. Here, this microcosm, this example, I said, you know, is this just a case where it's not worth a person's time quite literally to be a driver? Like, what are you paying these people? And the superintendent said, listen, we've given them raises. It's now more than $30 an hour plus bonuses. He said it's not just about pay. This is societal. This is systemic. This is deeper. And it's a problem facing, again, schools coast to coast. Hallie. Maggie Vespa, thanks for being all over this story for us live from Kentucky. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, two Nigerian brothers pleading not guilty to sexually extorting teenage boys and young men across the country. The two are accused of posing as women to convince victims to send explicit photos, then demanding money to not make them public. One of the victims, a 17-year-old boy in Michigan, died by suicide after being extorted. Number two, a member of the Proud Boys set to be sentenced today for his role on January 6th is missing. Christopher Worrell had been on house arrest after his conviction on seven counts. Prosecutors want a maximum sentence of 14 years. A lawyer for, for Worrell is declining to comment. Number three, new questions about foul play and the fire that burned down what's called Britain, Britain's wonkiest pub. It's more than 250 years old. It's the Crooked House pub burned down to ash. I mean, look at this a couple weeks ago. Then it was demolished, even without authorization. It had been sold just days earlier. Now, some new reports out of the UK say the new owners saw a landfill they owned go up in flames back in 2018. The whole fire is being investigated as arson. Number four, you know those blue light glasses that you can get off the internet or wherever to try to lessen the strain on your eyes, make your sleep better? A new study says, hey, they don't really do that. They don't really do anything. Experts say computers and phones these days don't give off much blue light anyway, and the glasses barely filter out any of it. 
In fact, the thing that emits the most blue light, it's the sun. So, so your best blue light glasses are sunglasses. How about that? Number five, former First Lady Rosalind Carter celebrating her 96th birthday today. She's spending it with her husband, the former president, who remains in at-home hospice care. We're told she plans to eat cupcakes and peanut butter ice cream and release butterflies in the couple's garden. To North Carolina now, and new details about the surprisingly aggressive steps this small group of North Carolina hospitals have taken to collect debt from thousands of patients. In some cases, targeting people who just lost loved ones, even threatening to take their houses. These hospitals have been able to collect some $57 million in medical debt from these lawsuits, according to Duke University and North Carolina State Treasurer. Patients interviewed as part of this new report say the worst part about the whole thing is the anxiety and the stress they feel, which aggravates whatever sickness they're dealing with anyway. Kristen Dahlgren is covering this one for us. She is joining us now. We're not just talking about a few lawsuits. Apparently, this is thousands of patients. The scope is big, and it's coming from a handful of hospitals. Help us understand the scope of this. Right. And let's just start, Hallie, by saying this looked at North Carolina, but a lot of people are telling us that this is really just what's going on around the country. Hospitals using these aggressive tactics. So let's zero in then on North Carolina and take a look. They looked at uh, court records from January 2017 to June of 2022. And here's what they found. 5,922 lawsuits targeting 7,500 some odd patients and families. So not just the patient who's sick, but sometimes their family after they die. As you said, $57.3 million in judgments went to the hospitals. The average judgment was a little over $16,500. So we're not talking about chum change here. This is a lot of money uh, going to those hospitals. Now, what did they say? So we reached out to some that were sort of identified as, you know, the biggest sewers in these cases. And what they told us, you know, sort of generalizing, they all said that they're doing this charity work. They do offer a lot of free care to people. But and one said that they no longer have a policy of suing. Uh, so they were trying to say that this isn't something that's happening to every patient there. But you got to ask question, questions about this, Hallie. We have this map here that shows how a lot of these lawsuits um, are coming from just a handful of counties in North Carolina. Um, it is, as we said in the introduction to the segment, Kristen, th what people have said is this is super emotional for them. They're already struggling with this like life altering thing in many instances, whatever illness they have. And then on top of that, this is happening to them. Can you talk more about the sort of the impact for 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 the people, for the patients? Right. So absolutely nobody wants to, you know, be in a situation where they need medical care, but it happens. Uh, and these are these big life changes. And, and I want to get right to this graphic because this full screen uh, really shows what some people are saying. Somebody said it makes you scared to even go to the doctor because you don't know what they're going to charge you. It's going to be another bill, another uh, lien. Once they start messing with you, they don't stop. And so that's what a lot of patients are feeling at this point. Most hospitals, you know, maintain these policies, according to a study by NPR, across the country to pursue patients for these medical bills. Another part of their investigation said that 41 percent of American adults have some type of medical debt. So this is happening to a lot of people. What, what are lawmakers doing about it, right? Because there is this sort of bipartisan push in some corners now to try to protect patients and their families from this kind of thing, in part by making medical costs more transparent. Right. And so we're talking about what a lot of people refer to as surprise medical bills, uh, lawmakers pushing in some cases for this transparency. So we reached out to North Carolina's treasurer on this, and here's what he had to tell us. This is not a Republican, Democrat, unaffiliated moral issue. Uh, when people are fearful about getting their medi the medical attention, not because of their fear of pain, but because of their fear of not being able to understand what things cost and how the billing works. So he in North Carolina trying to push for this. Other states are as well. Hallie, wouldn't that be nice? Kristen Dahlgren, thank you very much for all of it. When we come back here on the show, people in a remote city in Canada lining up to get out because one of hundreds of wildfires is closing in. Look at this traffic. The fire, by the way, not the only danger they're dealing with. We'll explain. Plus, take a look at this. How much would you pay for this house? 
why it's making headlines and not just for its list price. That's later in the local. Let's take it to Northwest Canada where you can see, look at this, that long, long, long line of cars as thousands of people try to evacuate with something like 200 wildfires burning in the area. The deadline for the 20,000 people in the town of Yellowknife is today. They've got to be out by today because look at that, the wildfire burning out of control nearby is expected to hit city limits this weekend. These are just some of the thousand plus fires burning all across Canada during the country's worst fire season ever on record. And the smoke from all those fires, it's drifting across the border to the U.S., affecting air quality again. Remember when it got really bad in early June? That's what you're looking at now from New York. Emily Aketa is joining us now. So what is the latest? Have the people in the most danger immediately been able to get out? Hey there, Hallie. Well, they're getting out by any means, whether it be by car, by bus, or by evacuation flights, which have been leaving roughly every hour, transporting people largely from the city of Yellowknife, which you pointed out. It's in a remote area, but still, it's the capital city of the Northwest Territories in Canada. More than 20,000 people there ordered to evacuate by today, ahead of the weekend. And here's why, because the, the firefight is only going to grow more critical, according to officials, in the next few days, because of shifting winds that are going to push the flames towards the city, really driving a lot of that uh, concern, plus not much precipitation in the forecast. Officials say roughly half of the population in the Northwest Territories has been displaced. So we're talking about thousands and thousands of people, federal resources, Canadian forces, all lending a helping hand. We heard from someone who describes the chaos in getting out. Take a listen here. After waiting 11 hours in Yellowknife, standing up and not getting no food and nothing like that, there is no coordination, there is no um, communication, there is communication breakdown when we, when we did arrive or when we were leaving and then when we arrived we had to stand in line for another six hours. And officials tonight assuring that they are not sparing any uh, any uh, response in terms of helping people and keeping them safe, uh, getting away from the wildfires. There are more than 1,000 different blazes burning right now in Canada. Hallie, to put these numbers in perspective, so far this year we've seen more than 34 million acres burned in Canada. Wow. Compared to America, that's more than 20 times what we've seen scorched here in the U.S., yeah. Hallie. It's a lot record-setting. Emily Aketa, thank you coming up here on the show. Why officials want people to keep an eye out for this invasive hornet that's just been spotted in the U.S. Plus, why the Smithsonian is just starting to return thousands of body parts, including brains, to some families. We're going behind the scenes with the reporters who uncovered this incredible story. In just a minute. British nurse found guilty today of murdering seven babies and trying to kill six others in the neonatal unit where she worked at a UK hospital. A representative for the families saying they're grateful for the jurors who sat through what they called grueling evidence. Today, justice has been served and a nurse who should have been caring for our babies has been found guilty of harming them. But this justice will not take away from the extreme hurt, anger, and distress that we've all had to experience. The nurse denied all the charges against her, but prosecutors say they found a note she wrote where she called herself evil and confessed to the killings, which happened in 2015 and 2016. Matt Bradley is joining us now. Matt, horrific details in this story. What else do we know? Horrific details and details that have really entranced and disgusted this entire nation. Now, what else do we know about this? I mean, she killed her babies, her victims. And again, these were children who were sometimes hours old, often less than a day. She would inject them with air. Uh, she would line their feeding tubes with insulin. Uh, these were, and there were a number of attempted murders. Some of these babies she actually attempted to murder more than once and failed. And again, these are neonatal babies. These are the most vulnerable children that you can possibly imagine. So we don't know much about the motive. The motive is probably, uh, you know, for people like you and I, Hallie, probably going to be pretty inscrutable. There's no real knowing why someone would do something like this. And you mentioned that she has been denying the charges from the beginning. That note, she says, was because she was feeling that way at the time because there were a lot of uh, deaths at the hospital. So she has defended herself until the very end, and we wonder if she's going to continue to defend herself as she's serving what's likely to be a very long prison sentence.
Alex. What else are we hearing from the families of the victims feeling just unimaginable grief at this point? Yeah, well, obviously, you know, with a, with a family and with losing a child, there's no justice that will ever satisfy uh, that terrible loss. But when it comes to these families, there were a lot of charges of attempted murder where the jury did not decide that this nurse was to blame. And so these families are very upset. And we heard from the representative of one of the families. Here's what they said. From losing our precious newborns and grieving their loss, seeing our children who survived, some of whom are still suffering today, to being told years later that their death or collapse might be suspicious. Nothing can prepare you for that news. So, Hallie, just goes to show these crimes were so heinous that even Nurse Letby getting the full force of the law, a lot of these families are still not satisfied. Hallie? Matt Bradley, thank you very much for those details. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it's tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Southern Bureau, some new concerns about this invasive hornet spotted in Georgia. Officials say it's never been seen in the U.S. before. It's native to Southeast Asia. It's a big problem for honeybees and for other pollinators, which obviously is not good for farmers. There's this push now to try to track and get rid of these hornets. Out of our Midwest Bureau, a house outside Detroit has just hit the market. Do you want to know what its list price is? A dollar. One buck. Two beds. One bathroom. One dollar. Uh, can we be real? It's seen some better days. The listing's a little tongue-in-cheek. It says that uh, the house boasts avant-garde floor hole art installation and a garden that is so wild even Mother Nature would raise an eyebrow. Still, for a dollar, man, you could, you could do some things here. And out of our Washington Bureau, a nearly intact 12 million year old bird fossil has just been dug up in the Chesapeake Bay off Virginia. The scientists say it's the skeleton of a gannet, a type of seabird. They're super excited because, because they're scientists and they get excited about these kinds of things, but also because bird fossils are rare since their bones are just so fragile. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture tonight. We're talking about the story of the Smithsonian Museum's so-called racial brain collection, a previously unreported set of hundreds of human brains and thousands of other body parts taken, in most cases, without consent from indigenous people and people of color around the world. The brains and body parts were mostly collected during the early 20th century and apparently gathered for research on a racist theory that white people and their brains were somehow scientifically superior to other races, a theory which, by the way, has been obviously totally debunked. The collection includes 254 brains and more than 30,000 other body parts taken from people from more than 80 countries around the world. Black Americans were of particular interest. The collection includes at least 57 of their brains. While The Post was reporting on all of this, the Smithsonian released a statement saying that they, I'm quoting here, they acknowledge and apologize for the pain our historical practices have caused people, their families, and their communities. They committed to forming a task force with the job of returning the remains. I'm joined now by the two Washington Post reporters who broke this story, Nicole Dunka and Claire Healy. It is so great to have you both on. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for, Thanks for having us. us. Of course. So you are the first reporters to really, um, I think, reveal the full story around this so-called racial brain collection. What brought you to the story? How did you how did you even start working on it in the first place? Well, it began when I came across an Instagram post from Jana Anya Nueva Langholz, who is an activist in St. Louis, and she was trying to mark the unmarked graves of people who had died at the 1904 World's Fair of indigenous Filipinos. And she told me four of their brains were taken to the Smithsonian. And so from there, that was really shocking for me. And I asked the Smithsonian how many brains they have and why, and then from there built out a database of all of these um, human brains. And I got involved as soon as I heard about the Filipinos. Honestly, uh, as a Filipino American, I just knew this was a chapter of history that nobody had really talked about, this 1904 World's Fair. And as soon as I heard about it, I started working with Claire immediately. One of the things that's so striking about the stories is that you, you spoke with several families connected to this collection here. I want to play a little bit of one of your conversations here. Listen. I want the Smithsonian to know that what they do is, is not right. It's a violation against uh, our family and against uh, our people. 
all the families deserve an apology and they deserve to have the remains shipped back to them. Nicole, can you tell us more about what it was like speaking with these families? It is a vulnerable place for somebody to be, to talk to a journalist about something like this. In some instances, they didn't even really know that, um, that this was happening, that the Smithsonian had the brains, essentially. Exactly. Uh, these were the relatives of Mary Sara, who died in Seattle of tuber tuberculosis in 1933. And so her family had no idea. We talked to her cousin, and she had no idea that her brain had ever been taken. In fact, Mary Sara had been buried. Uh, her body had been buried in Seattle, apparently without her brain. And so when we met her cousin, Martha Sara Jack, in Alaska, they were shocked. Uh, they had no idea. It was a really difficult conversation to have, uh, but they were glad that they knew because mm. they could start the process to actually get that brain back, and that's something that they're undergoing now. But it was a really difficult thing to let people know about. They would get very emotional, but we wanted them to kind of take the news as they could and not push them too much because we knew it yeah. was a really difficult conversation. Yeah, those can be... It, it just... It is incredibly emotional, um, and it is incredibly sensitive and delicate. We s talked a, mo a moment ago about the Smithsonian statement that they put out. They have started to take some steps here. They've stepped up the return of some of these remains. They've issued an apology. They've started a task force. They've hired more staff. A lot of this stuff happened only after both of you presented your reporting to Smithsonian officials, based on our understanding. So let me ask you. I mean your work, your journalism, um, resulted in tangible change. I wonder if both of you can take a minute to just reflect on that. Nicole, I'll start with you. I think we were just happy that we could really shed light on this collection, especially for these families, like I was saying earlier. I mean, I think there are tens of thousands of remains where some of those communities might not know. And so the idea that they are the ones who are supposed to start the repatriation process is really difficult because we knew that they didn't know already. And so we were really glad to be able to make some of those um, facts known to them. Yeah, I mean, everything Nicole said, like grief is so personal and so vulnerable. And so these families bringing us along on their journey was really humbling. And then the the aftermath of this reporting and, and knowing, like Nicole said, that a lot of families don't know, we're just kind of honored to be able to bring that to light. So there is perhaps more to come. Where do you go next with this? I think we want to follow through on some of these repatriation processes. Um, Martha Sara Jack is planning to either come to go to Seattle or to DC so that they can bury Mary's remains with the rest of her body in Seattle. And we actually now know that the Smithsonian had reached out to the Philippines after we started reporting. And there are they are in talks for repatriation there. The National Museum of the Philippines um, has said it supports this repatriation. So the remains that are within the Smithsonian's holdings from the Philippines could be going back home. Nicole and Claire, thank you both so much for your time, for talking us through kind of the behind the scenes piece of this just incredible piece of reporting. Really appreciate you being with us today. Still to come here on the show. Is it girl dinner or is it disordered eating? What some experts are saying about this trend that's all over TikTok. Stay with us. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight it happens to be something that you may be enjoying right now. Girl dinner. You know, a dinner that's like little snackies, whatever you have in your fridge, maybe some pickles and cheese, some chippies, whatever. But as the concept of the girl dinner has gone super viral, so have some of the questions around whether it promotes disordered eating. Our Savannah Sellers has more. Some popcorn and tangerines, cups of mac and cheese, maybe some homemade nachos. Does this really count as a dinner? This is my meal. I call this girl dinner. Girl, girl, girl dinner. Maybe not, but girl dinner is a trend with over a billion views on TikTok. Mostly women home by themselves, grabbing whatever food they've got without having to extensively plan, cook, or plate. 
It's so popular that now there's even a couple TikTok filters for it. I made a My Girl Dinner filter, which will what pick some random dinner? snacks to make sure, up your girl dinner for the night. But this quirky meal trend is getting some major backlash. Some online creators and medical experts worrying that some girl dinner videos aren't actually satisfying a person's appetite. And worse, it could be masking and normalizing disordered eating. It's just like these girls being like, oh my God, like one cube of cheese, like girl dinner. It's like... No, like, let's not glorify that because I think that's called something else. Licensed clinical psychologist Kelly Ruglis says that several of her patients have spoken to her about their difficulties with the girl dinner trend. If you are eating like a normal size dinner, and then this trend comes up of girl dinners. So you might push yourself to eat smaller amounts and consider it a dinner because it seems like that's what everybody else is doing. And with some people posting their girl dinners of a glass of wine or even just some chunks of ice, even if only in jest, the joke may end up influencing eating habits for people of any gender. It's really problematic because it's making a snack or a combination of snacks seem like the equivalent to uh, the nutrition that you would get with a normal sized dinner when it's not. Girl dinner is the most recent food related trend circulating online, but it definitely isn't the first. Content creators have been posting about their eating habits for years, stirring controversy. When you what I eat in a day video. One trend called what I eat in a day is posting videos of all your meals throughout the day. But some mental health professionals are skeptical. It tells the full story. Again, they give the false assumption that if you eat like this, you'll look like this, which is not true. These trends are becoming more popular as the issue of disordered eating among young people, particularly girls, is becoming more and more serious. A recent report from the Center for Countering Digital Hate found that within eight minutes of a 13-year-old joining TikTok, the teen was recommended content tied to eating disorders. TikTok told NBC News it's platform offers multiple tools for users so they can avoid seeing certain types of videos by filtering out particular keywords or hashtags if they choose. Rugla says all content around food and eating isn't inherently harmful. It can also amplify other messages like body positivity, but there's still a lot of progress to be made. So look, here are some tips from our experts. They might be easier said than done, I'll admit, but the issue is that with the algorithm, even if you're not following certain accounts, you might still be getting served certain content. So try to take a break from social media. If you're feeling impacted by what you're seeing on there, maybe even sometimes delete it altogether, at least for a little while. Hallie, back to you. Our thanks to Savannah Sellers for that. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage right here on NBC News Now, right now. As we come on the air tonight, Category 4 Hurricane Hillary closing in with parts of Southern California under its first ever tropical storm watch. Why L.A. officials in just the last few minutes are calling this a once-in-a-lifetime event as they're warning of catastrophic and life-threatening flooding. And on Maui, word of more missteps in the wildfire response that could have contributed to the chaos and destruction in the town of Lahaina. What we're hearing from locals in just the last hour. We're also learning a lot tonight about where former President Trump will and will not be next week. More on the timing on his surrender to police in Georgia, the court essentially, and the debate he's planning to skip at the moment. We'll take you live to the campaign trail. Down in Louisville, school is back in session for students there a week after a huge busing meltdown. My parents are telling us they're still skeptical about getting their kids home on time. And new details tonight around a group of North Carolina hospitals using some surprisingly aggressive tactics to get money from patients. What exactly they're doing that includes, in some cases, threats to take people's houses later on in the show. Hey there, I'm Hallie, and as we speak, a Category 4 hurricane is barreling its way towards Southern California, now under the first tropical storm watch it has ever had. The National Weather Service says Hurricane Hillary could create life-threatening and potentially catastrophic flooding. That update now is coming in thanks to data from the very first hurricane hunter planes that are flying through the eye of Storm Hillary, sending back some new data on just how intense it is. You can see it swirling from the satellite pictures there. A lot of people want to know where is the track. Well, this is it, at least at the moment. You can see the latest prediction. It's aimed right towards Southern California, right towards L.A. But here's the thing. It almost doesn't matter where specifically Hillary makes landfall because here's what we do know it's gonna drop a ton of rain over SoCal. 
We're talking about places like Death Valley and Palm Springs could see up to three years of rain in the span of just three days. That's why there's all this concern about flooding. Southern California doesn't see this all that often, right? You've got officials handing out sandbags in some towns so people can start to prep. This is super rare. It's a once-in-a-lifetime uh, event uh, that we're going to be experiencing. Uh, this really is an all-hands-on-deck effort. All hands on deck. That's why people everywhere are bracing for this. Joshua Tree is shutting down some spots of the National Park that are likely to flood. Some airlines are getting rid of change fees, too, for people planning to go to Cabo, because that is in the path of the storm as well. We've got team coverage here tonight with meteorologist Bill Karens tracking the storm. Liz Kreutz is in Los Angeles. Bill, I want to start with you. The latest update here on Hurricane Hillary. We also just heard from LA officials, um, you know, the potential for this to be a generational type event. Uh, this time of year, we're just not used to heavy rain in Southern California. Wintertime, sure, but now the leaves are on the trees. This is just a different dynamics when we get the winds and all that tropical moisture over areas that are deserts and mountains that don't have a lot of trees and vegetation on them. It's just a bad recipe for a lot of water problems. That is a number one concern. If I had a list of concerns, one through 100, that's one through 99. Uh, you know, maybe some minor problems with wind, maybe a slight chance of getting an isolated tornado or two, but really it's going to be all about the rain. So the storm is as strong as it's going to get. It was actually 145. Hurricane Hunters found it a little weaker than that. Still looks mightily impressive. Still a very powerful major hurricane. It's going to slowly weaken for the next 48 hours. That's how long it's going to take to travel all the way to here. So this storm is going to be booking. It's going to fly through Southern California. This storm is going to be moving at 25 to 30 miles per hour by the time it gets to San Diego. And if you've ever done that drive, it's roughly about 100 miles. It's only going to take three or four hours from the storm to get from San Diego to closest to LA and by Monday morning it's all the way in southern Nevada. So this is an in, this is an out type storm and typically with fast moving storms you don't worry about the rainfall too much but the problem is we have eight to 10,000 foot peaks. It's going to be like wringing out a sponge when this storm goes over southern portions of California in the mountainous areas and that's where we're very concerned. We know where the storm is heading. All our computer models are in excellent agreement. There is that tropical storm watch for southern California. In the central portions of the Baja this is all warnings that are issued now and probably tomorrow for from San Diego to Malibu, you'll probably go under a tropical storm warning. Right now, the, the literature is saying about 20 to 40 mile per hour winds with gusts possible up to 60. So that's like minor damage, gas station signs type things. You get Santa Ana winds in Southern California. This really won't be that much worse than that. As far as the rain, though, this is where things could be kind of unprecedented. Obviously, flood watches are up. A wide swath of yellow and orange, that's one to three. But I'm really concerned mostly with the spine of the mountains here near Santa Rosa and heading up towards the Santa mm -hmm. uh, uh, Anita, uh, Santa Ana Mountains, that's where we could see those five to 10 inch totals. The eastern slopes, that's where the runoffs, the debris flows, the catastrophic type weather concerns, that's going to be in this area of pink in here, Palm Springs southwards, and then isolated flash flooding in other areas in the mountains outside of LA. But uh, Hallie, this is an all water story, and this is like yeah. 6 p.m. Sunday to 11 p.m. Sunday, and that's it. Then it's done. So it's fast, but it's intense. And then the question is, what is the damage that you're looking at from it? Liz Kreutz, I know that you and our team there in L.A. and in Southern California are all over this. As Bill's talking about, it's so rare and it's aimed at a listen. It's a population center. There's a lot of people who live in this area. Yeah, Hallie, this is unprecedented, and I think that's exactly one of the freakiest things about this is that people genuinely just don't even really know what to expect because it's not something folks are used to here, and it's not really clear what parts of Southern California are going to be the most impacted, and it could be a wide region, a wide area. Millions of people live here, and there are flood watches and warnings in effect from the coastal areas to the inland areas like Palm Springs all the way up to the mountains. Now, you mentioned this earlier. A lot Los Angeles officials, they just gave a press conference where they talked about what they're doing to prepare here in the county. And here's what they're telling folks about how to be ready. Create that evacuation plan that was spoken about already. Build an emergency supply kit and try to have a battery backup for any essential medical equipment that you may use. During the storm, stay out of the ocean, flood waters, and always avoid moving water. 
Now, many communities are giving out sandbags. In fact, we're told that there's a line in Newport Beach for these sandbags right now. Some of the beach areas are also building sand barriers on the beach to prevent flooding in those low-lying areas. And San Diego is even considering releasing water from one of its reservoirs in anticipation of heavy rain and spillage from that heavy rain. So a lot of preparations underway right now, but I think one of the biggest concerns is just awareness and making sure yeah. folks who are used to the weather we're having now, this sunny, warm, beach-going weather, know that they shouldn't be going to the beach this weekend. They should be staying away from it, Hallie. Liz Kreutz, thank you very much. Bill Karens, thank you. I know you're going to have a heck of a 48 to 72 hours ahead of you, both of you. Really appreciate you being here with us. Let's take you down to Maui now, where in just the last hour, the island's electric company is facing a fifth lawsuit that alleges the company knew its power lines created a fire hazard. This is as federal investigators are headed to the island now to get a better handle on how those wildfires got so bad so quickly and new signs of potential missteps in the emergency response. We have just heard in the last couple of hours directly from people in the historic town of Lahaina, at least what was that town. It's been all but incinerated in these fires. Listen. Put the community first in any planning process for rebuilding Lahaina. The governor should work with the community to develop a plan that, needs, that meets the needs of the people. At least 111 people have died in the wildfire. That number is expected to go up as the search and recovery efforts continue. I want to get to Dana Griffin, who is live for us there. So, Dana, we've got this lawsuit. We also know that the top emergency management official in Maui um, on the island stepped down a day after defending his decision not to sound the warning sirens. Talk about the accountability piece of it. Talk about what you're hearing from folks on the ground. Yeah, people want answers. We spoke to a woman earlier today. She lost her home. She says she's a teacher. The homes that you see behind me, she says these are the homes that my kids stay in. She's been able to get in touch with eight out of 22 of her family members. It's important to note that some people have lost their cell phones and the service here is still very spotty. But she's very concerned. And she said that this administrator was wrong for saying, for one, not sounding the alarms and for not taking accountability. So when we talk about accountability, it's going to take weeks, months, maybe even up to a year to learn what happened and what were the missteps here. That's something that, that federal investigators that federal investigators are going to be doing even behind us. They are now looking for the cause of this fire. You've also got that independent third party that's coming in to figure out what missteps, what policies need to, need to be changed, and what were the actions that were taken before, during, and after. And these are all things that people want answers to as they're, one, wanting to rebuild and also wanting to find their loved ones who are still missing in the rubble behind me. Hallie? It's been more than a week at this point. Talk about the timeline for the search process and what we still expect. Yeah, there's no timeline. It's a yeah. slow, methodical, door by door, car by car. I just spoke with a member of the FEMA Urban Search and Rescue Team. He tells me that this is unlike anything he has ever seen. They're used to tornadoes. They're used to hurricanes. They're used to wildfires, especially when you think about the campfire in 2018 that killed some 85 people. These homes were spread out, but here, this is an urban, an urban area where you've got homes within feet of each other. This is making it very difficult. So it burned so fast and so hot. It's even changed the condition of the concrete. And and they're also concerned about the structural, the, the safety of the buildings. You may not be able to see it, but he pointed out a four-story building behind me. And he says they literally have to cut that building off layer by layer and put it on the ground in order to search through and make sure that there's no one in that building that they've missed. Here's what else he told me. Listen. This is very different than um, the, tr the traditional hurricane or tornado uh, or even earthquake because what we're dealing with here isn't um, as easy to find. We're dealing with something that was a very hot, very fast fire. We're going through every house with both people and with canines to be able to ensure that every part of that structure, every part of that business was looked through so that way we have the most confidence at the end of the day that that building's clear and we can move on to the next one. Yeah, and speaking of canines, Hallie, we had one come through here. We are in a field that I'm told by the locals that children play 
And so they actually had their canine come here around this mm. field just to make sure that no remains were found. Because I, one of the questions I wanted to know is, are these people that are being found in homes? Are they being found in cars? And they're everywhere because we're told that a lot of people, mm. they passed away from smoke inhalation. So yeah. they thought they may have been in a, a room that was safe or they may have ran for it, passed out. So they're finding people all over this town. It's just uh, horrific and a nightmare here. Even a week later, it will be a nightmare for so much longer. Dana Griffin, live for us there on Maui. Dana, thank you. We are just finding out more tonight. The former president, Donald Trump, is expected to surrender to officials in Georgia no earlier than Thursday of next week, according to multiple sources familiar with that planning. So that answers what's been kind of a big question on the legal timeline for Donald Trump. When's he going to go and get essentially booked and surrender, if you will? There is still another question on his political timeline, for, however. Will he show up for the first Republican primary debate that's on Wednesday? Well, it doesn't look like it. Sources familiar with his thinking tell our team he's trying instead to arrange a sit-down with former Fox host Tucker Carlson to air on the same night. Uh, that could get a little tricky, since a source close to Carlson says he's in Europe with no set-in-stone plans to interview the former president. Now, even if Mr. Trump is not on stage, you can imagine he will still be a target for his Republican rivals, like former New, Jer New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. Trump will go to the debate. Will not go to the debate? No. His loss. Shaq Brewster is joining us now live from Miami. So, Shaq, let's start with sort of the Donald Trump news here and the timeline that comes with it. Walk us through why what's going to happen in Georgia is different from what we've seen in the other three indictments for the former president so far and what else we're hearing. Well, Hallie, the biggest difference is that this time the former president will turn himself in at a jail and not a courthouse as we've seen him do the first three indictments. We know from the Fulton County Sheriff's Office that all 19 of these defendants will report to the Rice Street Jail. So you'll not just see former President Trump, you'll see his close allies like Rudy Giuliani, also Mark Meadows. And one note about this uh, jail, it's frankly infamous in that area. It's known for overcrowding, for horrible conditions. Six inmates died at that facility this year. 15 inmates died last year, including one from a bed bug infestation. So while we don't expect the former president to spend much time in that facility, these are unique circumstances. That just gives you an idea of the facility that he'll be entering this time around. I should note that the sheriff's office notes that this is unprecedented. And we they say that this is something that could change in a moment's notice. But that's at least what we're hearing at this point. We know that the deadline to see the former president turn himself in at that facility is Friday at noon. So we're preparing for a busy back half of next week. Uh, that is for sure. Midweek, you're going to start to see it on the debate stage, obviously. You're out with uh, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. He's down there in South Florida there. I, I have to imagine that he, we, listen, we know what his strategy is going to be. Go after Donald Trump. He's, yeah. th that's his lane in this Republican primary. The question is, how do the other candidates recalibrate if Donald Trump is not on that stage, considering he is so far and away the front runner here? Yeah, you can imagine those conversations are definitely happening right now because we know this from previous cycles, from any of these presidential debates. This is a big moment for these candidates. They talk about it all the time as they're at rallies, as they're cover, uh, in interviews. This is a big audience that they're going to get. And we know that Donald Trump was going to loom heavily over that stage no matter what. Now it's about how they either bring him in or how they respond to other candidates who bring him onto the stage. I'm talking about Governor Chris. Christie. Listen to what he said when I asked him about his preference for the appearance of the former president. Do you prefer that Donald Trump's on that debate stage on Wednesday? I prefer that everybody who wants to be president of the United States and win the Republican nomination be on the stage, because I think Republican voters deserve the respect to show up and to argue the issues with the other candidates who have qualified. You can bet a lot of money, Hallie, that Governor Chris Christie, former Governor Chris Christie, will bring up Donald Trump. We know that there are memos out there suggesting that DeSantis should defend the former president. We'll see what ultimately happens. But mm -hmm. no, despite the fact that Donald Trump will not be on that stage, you will know that he will loom large over what happens and what we see on that debate stage on Wednesday, Hallie. Well, and folks will watch it, uh, the, the post game at least, right here on NBC News Now with all of us. Shaq Brewster, thank you so much. Appreciate it.
a diplomatic show of force tonight from Camp David with President Biden flanked by the leaders of Japan and South Korea for their first ever three-way summit, announcing the launch a hotline to talk about how to respond to threats in the face of tensions with China and stepped up North Korean missile tests. That's even as President Biden is kind of downplaying just how much China is a factor in this meeting, saying instead it's all about finding ways for world leaders to stand together. I can think of no more fitting location to begin the next era, our next era of cooperation, a place that has long symbolized the power of new beginnings and new possibilities. We've all committed to swiftly consult with each other in response to threats to any one of our countries from whatever source it occurs. NBC's chief White House correspondent Kristen Welker is on the North Lawn. She is joining us now. So, Kristen, you heard the president say it there, right? The setting is about new beginnings. Explain why it is so sort of notable that Camp David is the location, not like, you know, the West Wing for these discussions. Great question, Hallie. Look, this is the first time that President Biden is hosting foreign leaders at Camp David. And of course, Camp David is the site of critical historical summits in the past, including when former President Clinton hosted the Israeli and Palestinian delegations to talk through uh, peace talks and to hold those peace accords there. They were the, it's the site of critical talks at the conclusion of World War II. So that really sets the scene here. They announced some big things with this summit, including intelligence sharing of ballistic missile threats, uh, regular joint military exercises, and then what you talked about, Hallie, what they're calling this hotline, which essentially allows these leaders to be able to talk if they perceive there to be some threat. Now, you played that and talked about the fact that President Biden downplayed China. China, though, Hallie, is looming large over these talks, of course, because the whole point, as you laid out at the top of these uh, talks that President Biden is holding, is to deal with a rising China, an increasingly aggressive North Korea, which, by the way, the U.S. has real concerns that Russia may be aiding North Korea, helping it to expand its nuclear arsenal. So both of those countries loomed large over these critical talks, Hallie. You know, it was interesting. You, you talk about, and you know this, Welker, more than anybody, just as much as anybody, China, North Korea, huge factors in the relationship here between, you know, the U.S., Japan, South Korea. Like, that is, that is a lot to it. You heard President Biden say, but that's not the whole thing. It's not the whole thing, but it's a part of it, right? Oh, you're absolutely right. Look, they there are growing concerns about China's uh, aggressions in the South China Sea, in the waters off of Japan, cyber threats, currency manipulation, Hallie, and the list goes on and on. And that is why China is so front and center, whether you are talking to officials from the United States or officials abroad on the world stage as well. Now, one of the key themes of this was the fact that South Korea and Japan came together for these talks. After decades of tensions, President Biden really encouraging them to put those tensions aside. He said these talks are critical to the security of the United States and all of the countries in that region. And that word security, Hallie, was front and center as these trilateral talks unfolded today. Kristen Welker, thank you very much. Good to see you. Right now, inside an Idaho court, a judge is deciding whether to delay the trial of the suspect accused of killing four University of Idaho students last fall. This is a case that has captured headlines all around the world. You see the suspect, you're about to see him sitting in court. The judge is listening to arguments from both sides about a bunch of things, like allegations of juror bias, questions about alibi, DNA evidence, for example. Brian Koberger faces four first-degree murder charges in the stabbing deaths of Kaylee Gonsalves, Zana Kernodal, Madison Mogan, and Ethan Chapin. There's only about two months until this trial is supposed to start, but this hearing has a big impact on the timeline. Is it going to stay on track or not? Aaron McLaughlin is joining us now. So, Aaron, is it going to stay on track or not? What do we know based on what the judge said? Well, you know, that is the big question overhanging these proceedings, Hallie. Right now, as it stands, this trial is set to go forward on October 2nd. In just six weeks' time, the judge himself saying these proceedings 
are rushed. But the fact of the matter is Brian Koberger, the defendant in this case, has not waived his right to a speedy trial, giving the state a six-month window with which to try him for these four murders. And at this point, the defense tactic seems to be trying to delay the proceedings by asking for stays in the hearings. A 37-day stay was last granted by the court. The prosecution saying the defense can't have it both ways, pushing the court to outline very clear schedule for the proceedings if this October 2nd trial date is set to go ahead, as so many experts have told me they are skeptical that that is even possible. I was talking to a, a, a prosec former prosecutor for the state of Idaho, and she outlined why it's so important to the prosecution to have a very clear schedule of order of proceedings. Take a listen. They are three months out. Um, this is a significant case with a lot of evidence, a lot of technical evidence, a lot of witnesses that have to be flown in. Um, and that's going to, you know, that takes a lot of, of, um, time and preparation and quite frankly money um if they are buying plane tickets and this is and that and then the case gets canceled and they have to redo everything while this proceeding was supposed to have addressed a whole range of issues including the alibi as well as the timeline right now most of the proceedings have been consumed by a number of witnesses the defense has called trying to compel the prosecution to hand over more of the DNA discovery we're waiting to see if there's some sort of ruling uh, in the next hour or so Hallie Aaron McLaughlin thank you very much Coming up here on the show, a lot more to get to, including Colombia shaken by a strong earthquake with some scary moments playing out on live TV. We're going to show you in a minute. Plus, the popular feature that will soon be history, maybe, on the platform formerly known as Twitter. Kids in Louisville are back in the classroom today, a week after a bus schedule meltdown left some kids stranded, others stuck on school buses until 10 at night. And while the problems there were supposed to be ironed out, some parents still ended up driving kids today when the bus didn't show up on time. I just hope they get it together and this is not going to be paid for by our jobs. We're not going to be late and then the jobs be like, oh, we got you, we understand. No, it's not going to happen that way. So they need to understand that you're inconveniencing us all around. Today's return is part of a staggered reopening. Elementary and middle school kids today, high schoolers back on Monday after the school superintendent took responsibility at a pretty spicy board meeting. It was about not anticipating these problems, and these should have been anticipated, and they should have been taken care of over the summer months. There is no doubt about that. I take responsibility for not asking the tough questions and not being as involved in the oversight as I should have been. Maggie Vespa is joining us now. She's been all over this story live for us from Louisville. I think it's fair to say this was not just a meltdown. It was an epic meltdown. It legit took a full week to try to straighten out. So here we are, 527 yeah. Eastern time. Are the kids home? Did it go smoothly? Are some parents still waiting? Hallie, not only are a lot of kids not home, but I want to point out, and this blew our team away, the plan right now for the rest of the school year is that a lot of kids wouldn't be home by this point. That's how bad this shortage is, that if everything with the bus route goes according to plan, a lot of little kids, like elementary school kids, wouldn't get home from school until like 5.30 in the evening. One dad told us, he said, to get his kids five miles from school to home, takes an hour and that is because they have so few drivers and so many kids that every route has a ton of stops on it so think just like how they would have to kind of snake through different neighborhoods making multiple stops along the way and listen the district said look we have 600 drivers now we had about 900 like less than a decade ago the shortage is staggering and what they've tried to do is kind of condense those routes like I talked about but they said the big thing that they didn't predict was that they also take kids to depots to switch buses as part of this new system that took way longer than they thought it was going to. And frankly, they said each stop, because this is a new system, also took way longer. So just as you said, epic meltdown all around. Parents, understandably, furious. Take a listen. The I just hope they get it together. And this is not going to be paid for 
about our jobs. We're not going to be late and then the jobs be like, oh, we got you, we understand. No, it's not going to happen that way. So they need to understand that you're inconveniencing us all around. That mom that we talked to, by the way, Hallie, she drove her daughter to school after the bus was late again this morning. She said, I have, I've had it, I have to take you to school, and then I have to go to work, as you heard. So parents still adjusting amid all of this. This bus driver shortage is not just a problem where you are, Maggie. It is a problem for school districts across the country, not having enough drivers to get kids where they need to go. Yeah, a company called Hop, Skip, Drive that apparently studies this sort of thing said their new study out, out this year. Uh, it actually 92 percent of school leaders nationwide, 92 percent report that they have a shortage of bus drivers. Here, this microcosm, this example, I said, you know, is this just a case where it's not worth a person's time quite literally to be a driver? Like, what are you paying these people? And the superintendent said, listen, we've given them raises. It's now more than $30 an hour plus bonuses. He said it's not just about pay. This is societal. This is systemic. This is deeper. And it's a problem facing, again, schools coast to coast. Hallie. Maggie Vespa, thanks for being all over this story for us live from Kentucky. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, the Justice Department is asking that Proud Boys leader Enrique Tarrio and his lieutenant be sentenced to more than 30 years in prison for their roles on January 6th. Both were convicted of seditious conspiracy. If those sentences are imposed, they'd be the longest punishments to come from the Capitol attack at this point. Number two, a new round of COVID vaccines should be effective against the variant that's spreading right now across the country. Initial data shows that shots from Pfizer, Moderna, and Novavax should protect you against that, uh, that variant. All three companies are waiting on approval from the FDA, meaning the shots will not be available for the next month or so. Number three, Elon Musk says X, the social network formerly known as Twitter, is getting rid of the block feature. That's what obviously lets you block people, block whatever. A lot of people say, hey, that's really important. Um, here's the thing, though, right? The Apple store, like Apple likes to have apps on its system be able to block. So it's TBD whether this is actually going to happen or not. Number four, current members of the dance crew at the center of the whole Lizzo controversy are coming to her defense. The big girls posted on social media thanking the pop star for their experience on tour, as well as shattering limitations. Lizzo is being accused of sexual harassment and creating a hostile work environment by several former dancers, allegations she denies. Number five, the former first lady, Rosalind Carter, turning 96. Happy birthday to her today. She's spending it, we're told, with her husband, former president Jimmy Carter, who remains at in-home hospice care. Rosalind apparently plans to have some cupcakes and peanut butter ice cream and release butterflies in the couple's garden. New details now about the surprisingly aggressive steps a small group of North Carolina hospitals have taken to collect debt from thousands of patients. In some cases, targeting people who just lost loved ones, even threatening to take their houses. These hospitals have been able to collect some $57 million in medical debt from these lawsuits, according to Duke University and North Carolina's treasurer. Patients interviewed say the worst part about the whole thing was the anxiety and the stress, which aggravates, in their view, whatever illness they're already going through. Kristen Dahlgren joins us now. We're not just talking about a few lawsuits. Apparently, this is thousands of patients. The scope is big, and it's coming from a handful of hospitals. Help us understand the scope of this. Right. And let's just start, Hallie, by saying this looked at North Carolina, but a lot of people are telling us that this is really just what's going on around the country, hospitals using these aggressive tactics. So let's zero in then on North Carolina and take a look. They looked at uh, court records from January 2017 to June of 2022, and here's what they found. 5,922 lawsuits targeting 7,500 some odd patients and families. So not just the patient who's sick, but sometimes Sometimes their family after they die. As you said, $57.3 million in judgments went to the hospitals. The average judgment was a little over $16,500. So we're not talking about chump change here. This is a lot of money uh, going to those hospitals. Now, what did they say? So we reached out to some that were sort of identified as, you know, the biggest sewers in these cases. And what they told us, you know, sort of generalizing, they all said that they're doing this charity work. They do offer a lot of free care to people. But and one said that they no longer have a policy of suing. Uh, so they were trying to say that this isn't something that's happening to every patient there. But you got to ask question, questions about this, Hallie. 
We have this map here that shows how a lot of these lawsuits um, are coming from just a handful of counties in North Carolina. Um, it is, as we said in the introduction to the segment, Kristen, th what people have said is this is super emotional for them. They're already struggling with this like life altering thing in many instances, whatever illness they have. And then on top of that, this is happening to them. Can you talk more about the sort of the impact for, for, for the people, for the patients? Right. So absolutely nobody wants to, you know, be in a situation where they need medical care, but it happens. Uh, and these are these big life changes. And, and I want to get right to this graphic because this full screen uh, really shows what some people are saying. Somebody said it makes you scared to even go to the doctor because you don't know what they're going to charge you. It's going to be another bill, another uh, lien. Once they start messing with you, they don't stop. And so that's what a lot of patients are feeling at this point. Most hospitals, you know, maintain these policies, according to a study by NPR, across the country to pursue patients for these medical bills. Another part of their investigation said that 41 percent of American adults have some type of medical debt. So this is happening to a lot of people. What, what are lawmakers doing about it, right? Because there is this sort of bipartisan push in some corners now to try to protect patients and their families from this kind of thing, in part by making medical costs more transparent. Right. And so we're talking about what a lot of people refer to as surprise medical bills, uh, lawmakers pushing in some cases for this transparency. So we reached out to North Carolina's treasurer on this, and here's what he had to tell us. This is not a Republican, Democrat, unaffiliated moral issue. Uh, when people are fearful about getting their med the medical attention, not because of their fear of pain, but because of their fear of not being able to understand what things cost and how the billing works. So he in North Carolina trying to push for this. Other states are as well. Hallie, wouldn't that be nice? Kristen Dahlgren, thank you very much for all of it. Still ahead, the rush to get out of a remote region of Canada with a wildfire burning out of control, creeping closer and closer. Plus, uncovering a shocking mystery at the Smithsonian. What led reporters to a collection of human brains and the disturbing reason at the heart of it all? It's tonight's backstory. Stay with us. Northwest Canada now, where look at this. You can see this super long line of cars as thousands of people try to evacuate with something like 200 wildfires burning in the area. The deadline for the 20,000 people in the town of Yellowknife to be out is today. They've got to get out because the wildfire nearby, the closest one, is expected to hit city limits this weekend. These are just some of the 1,000-plus fires burning across Canada during the country's worst fire season on record. And the smoke from all those fires, it's drifting across the border to the United States, affecting air quality again. This is from back in June. Remember that? Same reason, different outcome. That was in New York when it got really intense a couple months ago. Emily Aketa is joining us now. What is the latest? Have the people in the most danger immediately been able to get out? Hey there, Hallie. Well, they're getting out by any means, whether it be by car, by bus, or by evacuation flights, which have been leaving roughly every hour, transporting people largely from the city of Yellowknife, which you pointed out. It's in a remote area, but still, it's the capital city of the Northwest Territories in Canada. More than 20,000 people there ordered to evacuate by today, ahead of the weekend. And here's why, because the, the firefight is only going to grow more critical, according to officials, in the next few days, because of shifting winds that are going to push the flames towards the city, really driving a lot of that uh, concern. Plus, not much precipitation in the forecast. Officials say roughly half of the population in the Northwest Territories has been displaced. So we're talking about thousands and thousands of people, federal resources, Canadian forces, all lending a helping hand. We heard from someone who describes the chaos in getting out. Take a listen here. After waiting 11 hours in Yellowknife, standing up and not getting no food and nothing like that. There is no coordination. There is no um, communication. There is communication breakdown when we, when we did arrive or when we were leaving and then when we arrived, we had to stand in line for another six hours. 
and officials tonight assuring that they are not sparing any uh, any response in terms of helping people and keeping them safe, uh, getting away from the wildfires. Where there are more than 1,000 different blazes burning right now in Canada. Hallie, to put these numbers in perspective, so far this year we've seen more than 34 million acres burned in Canada. Wow. Compared to America, that's more than 20 times what we've seen scorched here in the U.S., yeah. Hallie. It's a lot record-setting. Emily Aketa, thank you. Still coming up this hour, Paris banning something pretty popular with kids. Why animal rights activists are calling it a victory. Next. A British nurse found guilty today of murdering seven babies and trying to kill six others in the neonatal unit where she worked at a UK hospital. A representative for the families saying they're grateful for the jurors who sat through what they called grueling evidence. Today, justice has been served and a nurse who should have been caring for our babies has been found guilty of harming them. But this justice will not take away from the extreme hurt, anger and distress that we've all had to experience. The nurse denied all the charges against her, but prosecutors say they found a note she wrote where she called herself evil and confessed to the killings, which happened in 2015 and 2016. Matt Bradley joins us now with more. I'm at horrific details in this story. What else do we know? Horrific details and details that have really entranced and disgusted this entire nation. Now, what else do we know about this? I mean, she killed her babies, her victims. And again, these were children who were sometimes hours old, often less than a day. She would inject them with air. Uh, she would line their feeding tubes with insulin. Uh, these were, and there were a number of attempted murders. Some of these babies, she actually attempted to murder more than once and failed. And again, these are neonatal babies. These are the most vulnerable children that you can possibly imagine. So we don't know much about the motive. The motive is probably, uh, you know, for people like you and I, Hallie, probably going to be pretty inscrutable. There's no real knowing why someone would do something like this. And you mentioned that she has been denying the charges from the beginning. That note, she says, was because she was feeling that way at the time because there were a lot of uh, deaths at the hospital. So she has defended herself until the very end, and we wonder if she's going to continue to defend herself as she's serving what's likely to be a very long prison sentence. Allie. What else are we hearing from the families of the victims feeling just unimaginable grief at this point? Yeah, well... Obviously, you know, with a, with a family and with losing a child, there's no justice that will ever satisfy uh, that terrible loss. But when it comes to these families, there were a lot of charges of attempted murder where the jury did not decide that this nurse was to blame. And so these families are very upset. And we heard from the representative of one of the families. Here's what they said. From losing our precious newborns and grieving their loss, seeing our children who survived, some of whom are still suffering today, to being told years later that their death or collapse might be suspicious. Nothing can prepare you for that news. So, Hallie, just goes to show these crimes were so heinous that even Nurse Letby getting the full force of the law, a lot of these families are still not satisfied. Hallie? Matt Bradley, thank you very much for those details. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here's some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Colombia, at least one person has been killed after a 6.1 magnitude earthquake shook the capital there. People ended up running into the streets. Here's what it sounded like on one live newscast. Fue la pandemia por COVID-19 la que hizo que está temblando. Iremos a... That's pretty scary. There were some aftershocks right after the initial quake. You could feel it, the shaking, from hundreds of miles away. Out of France, Paris is banning pony rides for kids in public parks starting in 2025. The rides are popular in some big tourist spots. This is after an animal rights campaign said the ponies were being mistreated, specifically by not having access to fresh water and by spending hours essentially stuck in trucks. And from the Gaza Strip, a unique business just opening up, a cat cafe, coffee and 10 furry friends. The founder tells the AP she views it as a unique escape from the pressures of life. Time now to get the backstory, our behind the scenes look at how a story comes together and how it fits into our bigger picture. Tonight, we're talking about the story of the Smithsonian Museum's so-called racial brain collection. 
A previously unreported set of hundreds of human brains and thousands of other body parts taken, in most cases without consent, from indigenous people and people of color around the world. The brains and body parts were mostly collected during the early 20th century and apparently gathered for research on a racist theory that white people and their brains were somehow scientifically superior to other races, a theory which, by the way, has been, of course, totally, obviously debunked. The collection includes 254 brains and more than 30,000 other bones and body parts taken from people from more than 80 countries around the world. Black Americans seem to be of particular interest. The collection includes at least 57 of their brains. While The Post was reporting on all of this, the Smithsonian released a statement saying that it acknowledges and apologizes for the pain our historical practices have caused people, their families, and their communities, and they committed to forming a task force with the job of returning the remains. I'm joined now by the two Washington Post reporters who broke this story, Nicole Dunka and Claire Healy. It is so great to have you both on. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for, Thanks having, for having us. us. Of course. So you are the first reporters to really, um, I think, reveal the full story around this so-called racial brain collection. What brought you to the story? How did you how did you even start working on it in the first place? Well, it began when I came across an Instagram post from Jana Anyanueva Langholz, who is an activist in St. Louis, and she was trying to mark the unmarked graves of people who had died at the 1904 World's Fair of indigenous Filipinos. And she told me four of their brains were taken to the Smithsonian. And so from there, that was really shocking for me. And I asked the Smithsonian how many brains they have and why, and then from there built out a database of all of these um, human brains. And I got involved as soon as I heard about the Filipinos. Honestly, uh, as a Filipino American, I just knew this was a chapter of history that nobody had really talked about, this 1904 World's Fair. And as soon as I heard about it, I started working with Claire immediately. One of the things that's so striking about the stories is that you, you spoke with several families connected to this collection here. I want to play a little bit of one of your conversations here. Listen. I want the Smithsonian to know that what they do is, is not right. It's a violation against uh, our family and against uh, our people. All the families deserve an apology and they deserve to have the remains shipped back to them. Nicole, can you tell us more about what it was like speaking with these families? It is a vulnerable place for somebody to be, to talk to a journalist about something like this. In some instances, they didn't even really know that, um, that this was happening, that the Smithsonian had the brains, essentially. Exactly. Uh, these were the relatives of Mary Sara, who died in Seattle of tuber tuberculosis in 1933. And so her family had no idea. We talked to her cousin, and she had no idea that her brain had ever been taken. In fact, Mary Sara had been buried. Uh, her body had been buried in Seattle, apparently without her brain. And so when we met her cousin, Martha Sara Jack, in Alaska, they were shocked. Uh, they had no idea. It was a really difficult conversation to have, uh, but they were glad that they knew because mm. they could start the process to actually get that brain back, and that's something that they're undergoing now. But it was a really difficult thing to let people know about. They would get very emotional, but we wanted them to kind of take the news as they could and not push them too much because we knew it was a really difficult conversation. Yeah, those can be, it, it just, it is incredibly emotional um, and it is incredibly sensitive and delicate. We talked a moment ago about the Smithsonian statement that they put out. They have started to take some steps here. They've stepped up the return of some of these remains. They've issued an apology. They've started a task force. They've hired more staff. A lot of this stuff happened only after both of you presented your reporting to Smithsonian officials based on our understanding. So let me ask you, I mean, your work, your journalism um, resulted in tangible change. I wonder if both of you can take a minute to just reflect on that. Nicole, I'll start with you. I think we were just happy that we could really shed light on this collection, especially for these families, like I was saying earlier. I mean, I think there are tens of thousands of remains where some of those communities might not know. And so the idea that they are the ones who are supposed to start the repatriation process is really difficult because we knew that they didn't know already. And so we were really glad to be able to make some of those um, facts known to them. 
Yeah, I mean, everything Nicole said, like, grief is so personal and so vulnerable. And so these families bringing us along on their journey was really humbling. And then the the aftermath of this reporting and, and knowing, like Nicole said, that a lot of families don't know, we're just kind of honored to be able to bring that to light. So there is perhaps more to come. Where do you go next with this? I think we want to follow through on some of these repatriation processes. Um, Martha Sara Jack is planning to either come to go to Seattle or to D.C. so that they can bury Mary's remains with the rest of her body in Seattle. And we actually now know that the Smithsonian had reached out to the Philippines after we started reporting, and there are they are in talks for repatriation there. The National Museum of the Philippines um, has said it supports this repatriation, so the remains that are within the Smithsonian's holdings from the Philippines could be going back home. Nicole and Claire, thank you both so much for your time, for talking us through kind of the behind-the-scenes piece of this just incredible piece of reporting. Really appreciate you being with us today. Still to come here on the show. Is it girl dinner or is it disordered eating? What some experts are saying about this trend that's all over TikTok. Stay with us. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight it happens to be something that you may be enjoying right now. Girl dinner. You know, a dinner that's like little snackies, whatever you have in your fridge, maybe some pickles and cheese, some chippies, whatever. But as the concept of the girl dinner has gone super viral, so have some of the questions around whether it promotes disordered eating. Our Savannah Sellers has more. Some popcorn and tangerines, cups of mac and cheese, maybe some homemade nachos. Does this really count as a dinner? This is my meal. I call this girl dinner. Girl, girl, girl dinner. dinner. Maybe not, but girl dinner is a trend with over a billion views on TikTok. Mostly women home by themselves, grabbing whatever food they've got without having to extensively plan, cook, or plate. It's so popular that now there's even a couple TikTok filters for it. I made a My Girl Dinner filter, which will what pick some random dinner? snacks to make sure, up your girl dinner sure for the night. But this quirky meal trend is getting some major backlash. Some online creators and medical experts worrying that some girl dinner videos aren't actually satisfying a person's appetite. And worse, it could be masking and normalizing disordered eating. It's just like these girls being like, oh my God, like one cube of cheese, like girl dinner. It's like... No, like, let's not glorify that because I think that's called something else. Licensed clinical psychologist Kelly Ruglis says that several of her patients have spoken to her about their difficulties with the girl dinner trend. If you are eating like a normal sized dinner and then this trend comes up of girl dinners, you might push yourself to eat smaller amounts and consider it a dinner because it seems like that's what everybody else is doing. And with some people posting their girl dinners of a glass of wine or even just some chunks of ice, even if only in jest, the joke may end up influencing eating habits for people of any gender. It's really problematic because it's making a snack or a combination of snacks seem like the equivalent to uh, the nutrition that you would get with a normal size dinner when it's not. Girl dinner is the most recent food related trend circulating online, but it definitely isn't the first. Content creators have been posting about their eating habits for years, stirring controversy. When you what I eat in a day video. One trend called what I eat in a day is posting videos of all your meals throughout the day. But some mental health professionals are skeptical. It tells the full story. Again, they give the false assumption that if you eat like this, you'll look like this, which is not true. These trends are becoming more popular as the issue of disordered eating among young people, particularly girls, is becoming more and more serious. A recent report from the Center for Countering Digital Hate found that within eight minutes of a 13-year-old joining TikTok, the teen was recommended content tied to eating disorders. TikTok told NBC News its platform offers multiple tools for users so they can avoid seeing certain types of videos by filtering out particular keywords or hashtags if they choose. Rugla says all content around food and eating isn't inherently harmful, it can also amplify other messages like body positivity. But there's still a lot of progress to be made.
So look, here are some tips from our experts. They might be easier said than done, I'll admit, but the issue is that with the algorithm, even if you're not following certain accounts, you might still be getting served certain content. So try to take a break from social media. If you're feeling impacted by what you're seeing on there, maybe even sometimes delete it altogether, at least for a little while. Hallie, back to you. Our thanks to Savannah Sellers for that. That does it for us for this hour. We've got more coverage right here on NBC News Now, right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.